these as respirers. Definitely, they just they found the gas can inside as well as the smell of gasoline, and they also found several hundred rounds of ammunition. He said hundreds of rounds of ammunition spread throughout the house. The interior, he said, is destroyed, even though from the outside, uh, the house still looks intact. Uh, but again, that fire starting around 6.30 this morning, and yes, we have confirmed that this house, the deed is, uh, has uh, Samuel Cassidy's name on it, so that this is the suspect. Uh, we did try to speak with Nathan this morning. To my colleague Damien Trapillo off camera, and I'll uh, make
Oh, there I was. No job, no education, no permanent home. I realized that a lot of that had changed since high school. And I wasn't the only one. Hey, Earl. Fast enough. Sorry, Randy, that's funny, but I'm not in a laughing mood right now. Don't beat yourself up too much about the fact that you make me feel like a job right now. You should go in the
Fun card. Help feel the rush again. It's time to soar and time to explore over one.
full breeze for us. Full breeze. Back a little. That was just a touch. One two 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 One two, one two. Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon. And uh, my name is Dwayne Midget. I'm a board member with the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation. And I'm also here on behalf of Mayor G.T. Bynum and the city of Tulsa. And I want to first welcome all of you all here today for the 12th annual Reconciliation in America Symposium. 
Uh, I want to also say thanks to everyone for being the heart, hands, and feet the past 12 years. We here at the Reconciliation, we're here at Reconciliation Park, a location for honoring memories of Greenwood's pioneers, the losses, and the resilience, and the dream. The park also stands to fill the gap of silence, the gap of silence imposed by history. The contributions of people of color within Oklahoma and as an outdoor museum. I want to uh, also say that I hope you all's experiences this week and next week will be meaningful and would lead to building bridges of reconciliation, not only in Tulsa, but across our nation. So at this time, I would like to ask Ms. Alicia Latimer to come forward. Hello and welcome. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am Alicia Latimer, a proud board member of the John Hope Franklin Center for Racial Reconciliation. And it is my great honor to introduce Mr. Ed Dwight today, a man whose resume reads. He is a former Air Force test pilot. America's first African-American astronaut candidate, an IBM computer system engineer, an aviation consultant, restaurateur, real estate developer, construction entrepreneur, and can be best described as a true Renaissance man. Ed Dwight has succeeded in all of these varied careers. However, for the last 40 plus years, Ed has focused his direction on fine arts, gallery paintings and sculptures, large scale memorials and public art projects. Since his art career began in 1978, after attaining his MFA in sculpture, from the University of Denver. Dwight has become one of the most prolific and insightful sculptors in America. For today, we will hear from Mr. Dwight as he shares his design of our beloved outdoor museum in which we stand today, the John Hope Franklin Reconciliation Park. This memorial features two major sculptural installations on the site of the 1921 race massacre, where the city of Greenwood was burned to the ground and 300 plus African Americans were killed. Please join me in the honor of celebrating the work of Mr. Ed Dwight and welcoming him to speak before us today, Ed Dwight. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. But there are some people uh, that, that I need to thank uh, while I have this uh, podium here. Uh, and then I'll uh, end up launching into uh, how I got involved in uh, doing this memorial. Uh, this whole project started with uh, Senators Don Ross and Maxine Horner. And uh, I don't know whether you people who are around when they were in office, but, but this whole idea was, it was their idea. And I, I never went through the normal uh, RFP uh, kind of system to get, uh, this was all done by, by my reputation. They had, they had heard that I was doing memorials like this, so they contacted me. Uh, in Denver uh, to come down and take a look. 
and I, I, what I'd like to uh, do is give you some background on why uh, these memorials are important. Uh, uh, but before doing that, I think we ought to talk about uh, Oklahoma, uh, the atmosphere in Oklahoma that caused uh, this memorial to, to be needed. Uh, the story starts back in 1832 when slaves were uh, 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 running away from their owners uh, and, and taken. Is there a way to fix that? Yeah, okay. you, you think you got it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, where I was, where, where slaves were escaping from the plantations and taking refuge in the Indian, uh, and there weren't reservations in those days back in the 1830s. These were, uh, these were Indians uh, that the Indian tribes that were on the East Coast. And so, so the blacks were moving in with the Indians and taking up refuge. Uh, and they weren't necessarily treated as slaves. Uh, they actually intermarried with the, uh, with the Indians and, and that's why you get a whole, whole range of, 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 of uh, especially with the five, what they call the five civilized tribes. Uh, and so the blacks were integrated with them. They, they didn't get married necessarily, but they didn't, oh gosh. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so in time, uh, the, these, these, these black slaves uh, intermarried with the Indians and pretty soon you have a uh, 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 mixed race uh, Indian and blacks on the tribal councils. Uh, during President Jackson's Indian removal policy, uh, he made all the, uh, uh, on the Trail of Tears, he made uh, the Indian tribes move to Oklahoma and naturally, they they brought what would be they weren't necessarily their slaves, but uh, but they brought the the the, the blacks with them uh, since uh, Oklahoma uh, since Oklahoma uh, was was one of the larger reservations, uh, the federal government owned three quarters of the state of Oklahoma. And so as a result of that, they, they used some of the, uh, the, the black soldiers left over from one of the wars. And so the black soldiers became the security forces for the reservations. Uh, and, and as a result of that, uh, you had inter, inter, intermarriage with the Indians. Uh, and there were, before the you know it, there were 60 black towns in Oklahoma, which you all know about, okay? Boley was probably, uh, the largest, but these are towns that were run by blacks. They had black mayors, black city councils. And so as a result of that, uh, the, there was some uh, insightful black promoters that, that since we had uh, uh, three quarters of, 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 of Oklahoma owned by, uh, uh, run by blacks, they had this bright idea that they, they wanted to turn Oklahoma into a black state. Uh, and this is really getting kind of crazy when you sit down and think about it. So the, the white rulers, if you will, of Oklahoma uh, uh, fought this like you won't believe. And as a result, uh, th there were uh, a lot of uh, lynchings and, and reaction to this. That was a bad reaction to to, uh, to, to the white community uh, 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 about allowing uh, 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 blacks to, to, to have any political power. Uh, they, the, these insightful blacks decided that they were going to go to Congress and try to turn Oklahoma into a black state. And, and, and that's if you if you go through your history, it'll 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 it'll. It'll reveal all this information to you. Uh, 
the idea of, of a black Wall Street was a kind of a laboratory uh, to show Congress that the blacks could run an entire state. And so as a result, uh, the, the black Wall Street was created uh, and they brought blacks. Uh, and there were millionaire blacks back in the 1800s, believe it or not. Oh, is this, is this one better? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't know, this is kind of loud as well. Um, uh, uh, but anyway, how I got involved in this thing, uh, and I need to tell you a story about why, you know, you know this whole idea here uh, is kind of important. And it's not only important to the white community, but it's important to the black community uh, as to why uh, these kind of memorials uh, need to be uh, built. Uh, uh, I grew up in Kansas. I'll, t I'll t t tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in Kansas City, and my mother was Catholic, uh, and uh, she wanted us kids to go to, uh, we didn't have a, a black Catholic high school in Kansas City. Uh, so back in 1948, my sister and I integrated a white high school, Bishop Ward High School there in Kansas City. And, and so I ended up with this white education, and I, I had white teachers. I never had but one black teacher in my life. And, and I ended up uh, with having white teachers all my life. I went into the military when I was 18 years old, became an officer, and went to pilot training, became a pilot. And, and, I, and I, was, I, I was an officer and a pilot. So my whole life was around white people. And, 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 it, and this went on from my entire career, uh, so much so that uh, uh, by the time uh, I was in my 40s, I'd gotten out of the military, and I was in this astronaut program when I was, ran all over the country and all over the world as this first black astronaut guy. And I was still living in this white world, this white universe. Uh, I got out of the military, uh, and and, and uh, uh, since I didn't know what black people did, uh, uh, I didn't know who Harriet Tubman was till I was 42 years old, if you, if you can follow that. Uh, I, I left the military, became a businessman in Denver, and I had five big businesses. Uh, and I, we elected our first black lieutenant governor in the state of Colorado. Uh, I had a large construction company where I was building condominiums and high-rise buildings. I built the city of Parker, Colorado. And, and so uh, our first black lieutenant, and I would go to my sites uh, at the end of each day, and I'd pick up all the metal in my building sites and throw them in the back of my Mercedes. And I, I, built, I built this, I, I bought this great big beautiful house so they didn't have any art in it. So. <laughs> So what I did, I started making art with all these leftover pieces of metal from my construction sites. And so the lieutenant governor had stopped by my house and he saw all this art in my house. Uh, and, and he called me to his office and he says, Ed, uh, I saw all that art in your house. Uh, they wanted a statue of me as the first black lieutenant governor. And they want to put it in the Capitol building. And I told George, I said, well, George, that, that's not what I do. I, 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 I weld nails together. I weld junk together. And he says, what I want you to do, Dwight, he says, you go down to the library, get a book, and teach yourself how to, uh, uh, how to model. And I said, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. And I had five companies at the time, and I was making about $150,000, $200,000 a year. And he says, dude, you got a future in art. If you follow what I'm telling you, you got a big future in art, and you're going to be one of the famous sculptors in the United States of America. And I told him he was crazy. And then he told me a story, which I think is very, very relevant to this. He says, Ed, did you know that uh, blacks have been on the, on the continent here for 300 years? And you can't go anywhere in this country, uh, in the city squares, uh, in museums, libraries, galleries, and find 
any black images of anything black people have done. And I looked at the guy, George, and I says, Lieutenant Governor, who the hell cares? And he looked at me, he says, what are you talking about? And, th and then he asked me these questions. Uh, uh, I said, I, I asked him, <laughs> I said, John, what, do, what did black people do? <laughs> uh, and, he, and he got really, he was, he was livid. He wanted to throw me out. Uh, and, 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 and so he says, uh, what I want you to do, uh, I had a flying service at the time. And he says, I want you to fly across the United States, take the one of those airplanes you got out there, and find me some black images. And so I, I took him up on it. I got in the, one of my jets, and I flew to all the big cities, and I went to the museums, and I went to the city squares. I could not find a black image of any, uh, of, you know. Uh, and and he, he told me, he says, if the, if the Martians were to come down and all the people in the United States were eliminated and they had to rebuild the culture, they would never know that black people uh, were even in the United States of America. And he, when I, I came back and he had two stacks of books, uh, all about slavery and Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And I sat down and I read those books. And I got so angry that I had been robbed of, of all the history. Uh, and here I was in my 40s. And I had no idea that, that black people had done anything. Uh, I had this idea that like a lot of the young blacks and the whites too, that you know, the world started that the day I was born. And it certainly wasn't started. And I, some of you have uh, understand what that means. That there, there, that there is no history, uh, that, and they don't teach history in the schools about all the stuff that happened before we all got here. And so as a result of that, I, I decided to quit what I was doing, making all the money I was making. Uh, I went back to school and I got a master's degree in sculpture, uh, and, and the state of Colorado gave me a pro project as a, bu as a buffer so I could uh, I had five kids, several in college at the time. Uh, uh, and so I stopped what I was doing, went back to school. Uh, they gave me a project. And since that, uh, once they got me started, I've done 130 memorials like this across the United States. So, uh, so he, he, he got me kind of rolling. Uh, you have to excuse me. My mouth is so dry. Uh, let, let me get a glass of water here. When they asked me to come down here, they didn't tell me it was going to be hot and dry. Uh, uh, so anyway, let's talk about the memorial itself. There's a, there's a story associated with this, uh, this memorial here. Uh, I, I was in Rome when I was doing, uh, working on my master's degree, and, and I was studying the art over there. And, and, and there's a, if, you go, if you go to the history books, uh, there, there, uh, among the uh, emperors over there, there was an emperor called Trajan, T-R-A-J-A-N. And what he, did, what he had done, he had built a huge tower. It's called the Tower of Trajan. And it was about all of his conquerings and, and the whole, his whole life, or how many battles he was involved in. And, and, and it was a, a self-appointed uh, uh, monument to himself. And I was really fascinated with that thing about, wow, this is really incredible that this guy would do this, uh, 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 this huge memorial, circular, tall tower. Uh, and, and so when I was asked to do this, and, and this is a, an untold story this, that's just now being told, by the way, uh, this tower here was going to be inside of a $40 million museum that would be sitting on this site. And as a result of that, 
uh, I designed this memorial. So when you went into the museum, along one wall, I, I, I started with at five o'clock when the riot started. And, and I walked through the riot and I had in the floor what was happening on an hourly basis as you walked around to get into this into, into the main atrium of this big museum uh, that this was going to be inside of. And the reason I thought this tower was appropriate because I had built a walk, uh, a, a rising walkway that circled, that, cir that went around this tower so you could walk around and be close to this tower as you walked all the way to the top of it. And you would be getting the messages that I was sending in the story that I was telling by walking up through this, this huge inside. Uh, and there was, a, uh, there was a big glass uh, uh, wall uh, which would be behind here. And out here would be a, a huge abstract sculpture dedicated to slavery and all that stuff. And, and I had been working on it with the architects and we're, we're being very, very proud of it because I had memorialized uh, the, the, the battle, uh, the, uh, uh, the riots on an hourly basis. So when you went through it, you got a full education about from five o'clock on and, and the events that were taking place included the next morning when the Air National Guard came in and bombed the rest of the building that was still standing. Uh, but this is a, a story of self-defeat. It turns out that uh, I will not name this lawyer's name, but he was a civil rights lawyer. At the same time we were doing this, uh, this particular lawyer sued the state of Oklahoma for $60 billion. And the governor and the, and, the, and the assembly and the Senate and the House met with us and asked us to go to this black lawyer and, and to back off from the lawsuit. The, uh, and, and if he didn't back off from the lawsuit, there was going to be no memorial here. So we went to this lawyer to say back off. Uh, this lawyer happened to be black. Uh, uh, and we asked him to back off because this memorial was more important uh, than him making a lot of money. And that's what the whole thing was about. He refused to back off. So the state of Oklahoma decided that, well, you're not going to have a memorial. And it, and it turns out that uh, there was some money that had been scraped together. And that's how we ended up. They called me up and asked me, what could I do uh, for the amount of money that they could raise? Uh, and this is what I did for the amount of money that they could raise. So uh, we, we, this was a case of, uh, of uh, black, what I would call black on black crime, if you will, whereby we mi missed an opportunity to get a $40 million museum to really tell this story. But we are very, very proud of what we did, what we were able uh, to get. But uh, this memorial at the time was going to be uh, uh, inside and totally protected from the weather uh, with a fountain and all the stuff that you see here. As, as far as the design of it, uh, that part was easy uh, because uh, I started out, if you walk around it, I started out with the slaves coming over. I uh, transitioned to the, uh, uh, to the Trail of Tears. Uh, I got up to, to rebuilding uh, or the burning uh, of Greenwood and the rebuilding of Greenwood. And at the very top, uh, I honored the 29 uh, people from Greenwood uh, that went over to, to try to save Dick Rowland. Uh, and and I, I actually put Dick Rowland's name. He was a 19-year-old young man. And there was a lot of wild, crazy stories out there about him raping this white girl. Uh, and I, uh, I was so interested in this thing. I went and I got all the trial uh, uh, I get read thick, thick of the, 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 the whole trial. I read every page of that trial, and it turns out that uh, uh, Dick Rowland knew this girl, uh, and uh, th they had known each other, and she uh, had moved into his apartment, and, and she was going to move out, and that's when Dick Rowland got upset. A 19-year-old kid, he got upset. She was an elevator operator in a, in a, in a building there, and he went in and she was telling him that she was moving out of his apartment. Uh, and so that's, that's when the tussle started. 
and that started the the, the riot. And ironically, uh, it, 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 it was a whole day passed, as you all know, uh, and it was the newspapers, the newspaper article that actually started the riot because the, the day before nothing was done, but the second day when the newspaper ran that article about him you know, possibly assaulting this white girl in the elevator, uh, uh, that's when the riot started. Uh, and, and so there were 29 uh, blacks from Green, uh, 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 Greenwood that went over to save Dick because they thought they were going to lynch him. Uh, and it turns out that they were waiting for them. They had, uh, it was near five o'clock, but some of them had gone home to get, they were told uh, there were about 10,000 that had, had, a, uh, had, had a symbol over there demanding the sheriff bring Dick uh, rolling down so they could lynch him. Uh, and these blacks went over, 29 blacks went over there and got their guns. And it turns out that they, uh, most of them lost their lives. So I, I, had to, I had to package all of that and, and put it on a memorial so that it would prompt you to start asking questions and, and to go back and look at really what happened to this story and how this the whole thing happened. Uh, and, and there was a lot of tragedies like uh, 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 the medical doctor from the Mayo Clinic that they, uh, they brought all of these black millionaires and black accomplished people into Greenwood to convince Congress that, that blacks, if they could operate Greenwood successfully, uh, this was gonna be a laboratory so that blacks could run Oklahoma as a black state. And so we, we gotta go back and remember that whole idea as to how this whole ride got started. And the other issue was, you know that the you know the the whites in downtown Tulsa, uh, Greenwood was a self-supporting little little enclave, and it it wasn't a city at that time really, uh, but they had a, a chain of grocery stores and meat, meat stores and jewelry stores and hotels and theaters, and it was a self-contained uh, town, and then didn't need to go to Tulsa for anything other than to do subservient work. And Tulsa didn't like that. I mean, the, the, and so they were trying to find a reason to decimate this place uh, and, and not allow uh, any growth to come out of here or any success to come out of here uh, because it, they, Greenwood represented a threat to the power structure here. So that's why this whole thing happened. Uh, and I, I, I can't get into overall politics about how, uh, but I, I do study, uh, the, you know, the politics of, of racism and, and uh, you know, how the Europeans came to America, uh, uh, took the land away from the Indians, uh, but they were running away from something too. They were running away from, from, from their own uh, suffering and stuff like that to get here. And so if you got here, let's think about the, the white man's thinking at the time. Uh, you know, I, I'm over here and these Indians don't, uh, they're, they're just kind of in the way, so we'll get them out of the way. But, but this whole idea of, of, of we, we throw this word around called white privilege, uh, and, you know, and they come up, well, this is mine now. Uh, and so, but as, as we move through, through, through history and the civil rights movement, which basically the white population uh, begrudgingly, uh, after a bunch of fighting and riots and stuff like that, uh, allowed a civil rights law a voting rights law, and they started creeping up and allowing uh, blacks to have progress. And I think we were kind of on the road to something here un until four years ago, when uh, we, we had, a, had, had, a, had a person that allowed every kind of hatred you could possibly imagine that you harbored, and, and it was both black and white, uh, you know, where everybody became your enemy. Even your best friends become your enemy. Uh, your families became separated behind uh, whether you're going to be a racist or not a racist or follow the, this clown uh, uh, in, in separating us where we started hating each other. And the violence that's going on now, I don't know how we're going to uh, you know, bring this thing back to normalcy uh, until we get rid of this cult thing that we have going on now where you're allowed uh, to beat the hell out of somebody if, if they step on your toe. 
if you look at the news and the airlines, they were, are now flying again. And, and they're beating up flight attendants and are beating up other passengers. This is the craziest thing in the universe. I'm trying to figure out how the hell did we get here? Uh, so I don't know. I don't have all the answers to all this stuff, but, uh, but building memorials uh, is, is, to me, is a kind of a step in the right direction. But the building these memorials is not just for white people to, uh, to come and look and say, oh, oh, oh they did something, you know? Uh, it's for black people too, because I'm a perfect example of, of beginning to be 42 years old <laughs> Uh, and not knowing a dang thing about my own history. I mean, I'm not proud of that, but it happens in life. Uh, I, I was given a speech in Chicago, and this young black guy walks up to me, and I was, I was praising uh, Dr. King, and I was praising some of the civil rights uh, leaders in my speech. And this young black guy comes up to me, and he said, brother, you know, you got to get off all this stuff about Dr. King doing this and Dr. King doing that. Uh, you know, he says, Dr. King wasn't with me when I took my law finals. You know, he wasn't in the room helping me. I did that all by myself at Yale. And I, re I, I retorted, I said, dude, if it wasn't for Dr. King, you wouldn't have been at Yale in the first place. And, and, and so it's that kind of thinking that, that we have uh, that has permeated our, 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 our minority race and our minority thought about, uh, uh, you know, about we did it. Uh, I did this all on my own and nobody uh, else has done a darn thing to help. And I have another story to tell. Uh, uh, I did a huge memorial down in South Carolina. And I was a guy by the name of Vern Smith. I, I, I don't think he'd be upset with me mentioning his name. He was a six foot four guy on the head of the budget committee. And I was in, I had given a, 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 a talk, a proposal to the joint session down there uh, in, in the House and the Senate. And so he asked me to come up to his office. And he says, Mr. Dwight, he says, you sound like a real intelligent man. And he says, you know, our people down here in South Carolina are very happy. Our coloreds are happy and our whites are happy. And I don't want you bringing any memorial or anything down here that's going to upset our blood. But do you get what I mean? And I said, yeah, I think, I think I do. Uh, and, and when he got, when I got up out of the chair, I noticed he had a, a, a ski patrol uh, a, a button uh, pin in his lapel. And I says, oh, you belong to the ski patrol uh, in World War II. He said, what, what do you know about the ski patrol? I said, well, I've done a sculpture for them. That's how I happen to know about it. And he lit into a, a, a deal about, you know, I'm from South Carolina, and they sent me to Vail, Colorado, sent me over to Italy, and I never fired a shot. And I, I you know, and he t went through all this stuff. Uh, and so anyway, I went home, I did the memorial, brought it, and it was, I didn't change anything in it, by the way. And, and so uh, we were erecting the memorial. And so he came out of his office in the Capitol building, and he came down and he says, can we talk? And I said, yeah. So he walked me through the whole campus down there and, and he talked to me about all of the Confederate soldiers, how many slaves they uh, uh, killed. Then he pointed me to a big apartment building and he said, you know, there's 5,000 slaves underneath that apartment building because all we did was just take it. When they died building the Capitol, we just threw them in this big hole over there. And these people don't even know that there's 5,000 blacks, slaves, uh, underneath that building. Uh, and then we, after we came back to the sculpture, we stood in front of the education panel that I, I had there. Uh, and he said, I got to tell you a story. He says, I used to be the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And I ran for office. And they were talking about giving some money to some black people for education. And I said, what the hell you will give money to black people for education? And he says, while you were gone, I, I had gone to lunch. He said, I went through every one of these panels. And do you know, I've never looked at life through a black man's eyes before. And the guy reached in his pocket and he gave me a check for $10,000. And 
and I guess he was buying his bias or racism, I guess, but he gave me a check for $10,000. And that, and he started crying. And the man walked, the guy is six foot four inches tall, and he walked back into the Capitol uh, with, his, with his handkerchief on his, on his face because he was crying because all of a sudden he had, was able to look at life through a black man's eyes. So as a result of that, uh, that's why I do these memorials. Uh, I've done 130 of them around the country. And the letters I get, both from black and white, are, are, are thank you uh, for, for telling that story. And thank you for uh, uh, telling it so we could understand it. So, so that's what the memorial is about. And uh, uh, I, I don't know whether I've enlightened anybody or anything in the process here. But I was asked to do this, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I appreciate you being here, uh, and I appreciate you having me. So if anybody's got any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Yes, yes, I do. Thank uh, you very yeah, much, okay. Mr. Dwight. Yeah. Would you talk a little more about some of the design of uh, the park? We'd really love to hear directly from uh, you uh, about things like the waterfalls, uh, uh, and what was in your mind when you made this? OK. Uh, what, one of the things that, 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 that struck me when I was reading, I was doing all my research, uh, is uh, I, I, th these, these sculptures here are, are from three famous uh, photographs. Uh, and, and I wanted to reenact those photographs. And uh, the, the, the boy with the, with the guns, uh, 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 when they were in front of the police station, uh, they made a call out uh, to go home and get your guns. And, and so some of them broke into the sporting goods store and took guns out of there. Uh, and, and so this was this 14 year old kid. He had gone home and found every gun he could find. Uh, he had guns in his, on his, in his belt. He had guns everywhere. Uh, and I saw that and I was fa fascinated. But there was a photograph of him with a cigar in his mouth and the kid was 14 years old. And I thought that was a fascinating and I, I just had to capture that. Uh, the, the, the gentleman holding the baby, uh, he was the head of the Red Cross. Uh, and, and his parents, the parents of that baby were killed. Uh, and he had rescued that baby and had taken the baby to the basement of his office. So, I mean, so they, uh, you know, you never know who's going to be doing the killing and how, who they're going to kill. So, uh, but he rescued the little baby and took him down and they saved the baby's life. But the, the baby's parents were killed. Uh, the other one with with with, with uh, holding his hands in the air, uh, he was a construction manager for uh, for one of the larger builders here, uh, uh, and, and uh, <laughs> this is a funny story. Uh, uh, this guy uh, with, with, uh, he <laughs> he was a construction manager, right? And so he he wasn't at his construction site. Uh, and, and so the guy that, that owned the construction site that was doing the building was, had a little money. So he called the sheriff up and, and he said, you, have you got John down there in jail? <laughs> and, and he said, yeah. He said, well, you, you, you let John out because John's got work to do. <laughs> and, so, and so that's John. He's a construction guy that to show you the power of politics. Uh, he was okay because he worked for this white guy, and his white and, and he, his white guy needed his uh, his buildings built. So, so th that's why I picked those three uh, to use as an entry, an entryway. And of course, it had to have a backdrop. Uh, and, and you know, water. Uh, I I, I really kind of wanted water to be a part of this thing. You notice there's water there, but I I wanted uh, fountains uh, to be you know going up in the air and shooting up in the air. Uh, and so uh, the alternative to that was to have a, a, this waterfall as a backdrop uh, uh, you know, to this entryway, because I wanted when people come in, they, they would look up. And, and that's the reason I used those, those, those uh, separators or granite separators to, 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 to excite the public as they walked in to, to see what they were going to see. Uh, the way to do that is, is uh, you got to you got to get their attention. In other words, that's what I've learned in building the memorials. You got to get people's attention from the get go. So when they walked in and saw that, and then they hopefully they'd be curious enough about why I picked those three people, uh, and then to, to go down and see the rest of the memorial, then 
it would be a lesson to them that were, but where I had to start them out uh, uh, as they came in and to get their attention. Uh, and so they would proceed down and read the, all, all of this, all of the uh, bronze plaques to get the story and everything. So, 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 so that's why they're there. Anybody else got any? Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I, I read the car came by. I didn't really hear the tail end. Of the, 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 I, I think she's asking about the number of bills across the country, uh -huh. asking for or telling teachers that they cannot teach about oh, the history. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, don't get me started on that one. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's absurd. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely, uh, incredibly absurd. You know, and this is fallout from, you know, from the cultish. A situation we're in today. I mean, we're 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 in a we're living a cult life, and what I don't understand on the part of the sane white community, why they would allow their country, uh, which uh, uh, there is no other country like you travel around the world, there is no other country like America. It just it don't doesn't exist, and so and to allow all of the things that we held dear, our capital. The rating of our capital, all these crazy laws that that it's it's like a dictatorial takeover, and 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 the and the short sightedness that I see about what in the world do they think is going to happen, uh, and and they, and they assume that the black community is going to go quietly into the sunset. Now we've been very patient in the black community. There have been no riots. There have been more riots from white. Uh, 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 forces than from blacks. We've been very patient. We, 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 all this shooting that you see, and we, we had another shooting today, and, there, and that's, that's not going to stop because we've opened that door and given permission for the crazies to go out. Texas just passed a law when you don't need a permit, you can carry a gun, you don't need the background check, you need nothing. All you got to do is go get a gun and you can carry it. That's insane. Uh, you know, and, and then they're going to work. I don't know what the downstroke is or the upside is for the Republican Party to, to, to follow all this stuff as if uh, the black community is just going to lay down and, and, and be rolled over. And, and that's not going to happen. Any, any other questions? Uh, uh, so, Mr. Uh, would you would you mind if if there's one part of this part that you would want people to appreciate the most, what is it that you would want them to really recognize and walk away from after they've seen this part? Well, you know, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, I would tell the same story about everything that I've ever done. Uh, you know, you know, one of the questions that I've asked as to why, uh, uh, why I, I'm in such demand right now, I have 13 memorials waiting on me to do, and it has to do with T you know, telling a complete story about what actually happened in this sense. Why is this thing here? What in the world happened that, that, that prompted anybody to build a memorial there? Well, you know, why would they do it? And so my job is to say, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want you to come into anything that I've created and not walk away with a hell of a lot of questions. And those questions have to do, those are good questions, not negative questions about, you know, what really happened here? And the reason I say that is, is my email reflects that. They, 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 they go to my memorials and they say, my God, I, you know, you explained it in such a way that I understand it. Uh, I, I, I have, a, 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 over time I've done, uh, I've worked with uh, PhDs that have done uh, their PhD in my memorials, and I have to work with them to, to supply them source material for their for their for, uh, for their dissertations. And, and I'm one of the few people that, uh, uh, from my talking to other artists, don't get that kind of uh, uh, kind of kind of attention. And it has to do with telling a story that was worth telling 
telling it in such a way that it arouses your curiosity for, for you to go find out more about it and to tell other people about it uh, and to soften all of this anger and to soften all this stuff to say, you know, we're not uh, here uh, with, with, with guns and, and our solution to the problem is, is not with guns coming from the black community. We went through that period of time that didn't work very well. Uh, and so there's, there's no option to go get guns uh, against the white community. You can't do that. So the, so the next best thing we can do is tell a story, both for black and whites, to go look and see, well, you know, these guys are not lazy like everybody says they were. These guys did some things that like every, they say they're lazy and don't do nothing. They want to stay on welfare. They don't want to work. They're sucking all our taxes up and taking all our jobs. And, and this stuff about taking jobs, this is the craziest thing. Black people are 10, 11, 12% of the population, okay? Now, how in the devil can 10% of the population take over 89% of the jobs? It, it doesn't happen that way where there's not of us, enough of us to go around <laughs> to take all your jobs. And so, but people don't think that way. They think that, well, that guy's, you let the blacks out, they're gonna take our jobs. Well, there's not enough of us to take your dang jobs. It's just not gonna happen. Even if we open the door and say, oh, you black, you 12% of all you black people, come and take the job. And we feel about this much of the job thing. Uh, you know, this is nuts. This whole nutty thing about harboring this nutty thing about welfare and jobs and all that crazy stuff is a crazy idea that, that has been fed to this country. And, and, and the young white people, they say, eat it up. Uh, you know, they eat this thing, oh yeah, that guy's gonna take my job. And it's absurd. It's absolutely incredibly absurd. Okay. Would everyone please join me in celebrating Mr. Ed Dwight? We thank you, sir, for your lasting imprint on Tulsa through this memorial and all the work that you've done over your lifetime. Thank you very much. And we do invite everyone to our symposium later this evening. We will have Annalisa Bruner at four o'clock at OSU Tulsa. She is the great granddaughter of Mary Jones Parish. And so you can see those things live on the CBS apps. And we invite you to join us at four o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.